Second countdown is continuing. Happy Friday. I will schedule a review session, uh, as I have done previously for the first exam. Um, I will announce that next week sometime. I would guess it would be, let me think about that, I think my, my schedule. I would guess that would likely be on Tuesday evening. Um, and with respect to where the material will go on the exam, it will likely go through Monday. Okay? So we won't finish glycolysis, but we will start glycolysis. So we, however, however far we get, uh, likely, I haven't, I haven't decided for sure, but likely we will finish with where I finish the material on Monday. Okay? All right. So today I'm going to talk um, uh, most of the uh, period about uh, things relating to energy and metabolic control. And there's yet another level of control that exists in cells. So you've been seeing things like covalent modification of enzymes. You've seen uh, the allosteric regulation of enzymes. Uh, but yet another consideration we have with metabolic processes and controlling reactions is the concentration of the substrate and the product. Okay? Those have an enormous influence because those are things that we have no other way around. Cells have to work within the confines of the concentration of materials that they have. And the reason is that because the concentration of those things determine the favorability of a reaction. If reaction is not favorable, it's not going to go. Okay? So even if we control the enzyme, we have the enzyme turned on, if the concentration of substrate and product isn't sufficient to allow the enzyme to, to allow the reaction to proceed in the desired direction, the cell has no control over that. So it's important, therefore, that we understand the role of energy, the Gibbs free energy, relative to the um, uh, control of metabolism, ultimately. Well, metabolism is, um, as we will see starting on Monday, a very um, uh, sequential uh, process. We, we describe metabolic processes as occurring in pathways. And you've seen a little bit of a couple of pathways already. We're going to see them up close and personal on Monday. Uh, but this uh, schematically shows us the process by which glucose is converted uh, from a six carbon molecule into two three carbon molecules known as pyruvate. That process is a pathway we call glycolysis. And we see that pyruvate is um, uh, has two possible fates in um, our cells. And those two possible fates depend upon the conditions in which the cell finds itself. Is there plenty of oxygen or is there not plenty uh, of oxygen? And so we see in this very simple schematic that two things. First of all, that there's a series of steps that gives us a product. And we also see that pathways have forks. They have different directions that they can go. And that's not unlike we would see if we had a road map. When we see a road map, there's several ways of getting to Portland. The easiest way is probably I-5, but if there's congestion on I-5, we could go 99 and do some zigzag way to get up to Portland, and we would get there. So having alternate ways to get places or having alternate responses that cells can uh, have relative to the conditions that they find themselves in are very, very important. So that's just a very general thing uh, relating to pathways. Yeah. You guys want to learn all that before the end of the term? Uh, no, no, we're not going to. Uh, but this is actually a very nice schematic of metabolic pathways that occur in almost every cell on the face of the Earth. We don't really see giant fluctuations in this schematic that's there. What you see at each place on there, uh, each place you see a little node, a little knob there, that's an enzyme. Enzyme catalyzing a reaction, OK? And so every place on there, we see um, the complexity of metabolic pathways. And we realize that what cells have to do in controlling metabolism is extraordinarily complicated. Extraordinarily complicated. We've been tackling it a piece at a time, regulating the enzymes. Now we're going to talk about how the concentration of products regulate those things. But I want you to have a feeling that wow, this is really complicated stuff in terms of how coordination of all this happens. The individual reactions you'll see are not complicated. Okay? And we're going to take them slowly, and we're going to take them one at a time. All right? But coordinating this to get a response overall of the cell is greater than we can model on a computer right now. 
we can't model the complexity of this system uh, adequately in a computer at the present time. That tells you a little bit about how complicated this process is. Well, when we think about energy, one of the first things that comes into people's minds is um, ATP. I refer, and I've referred to this in the past, of ATP being the sort of gasoline of the cell. That's one way people refer to it, because it powers many things that cells could not otherwise do. Okay? Well, what does that mean? Well, some reactions on their face value are energetically not very favorable. The first reaction of glycolysis, for example, putting a phosphate onto glucose. If we just take phosphate and glucose and we take an enzyme and we try to put them together, what we discover is that energetically it's not very favorable. It doesn't go very far forwards. In fact, it mostly goes backwards. Okay? But if we take that same enzyme and we use ATP instead of just phosphate by itself and we use the energy of ATP to put that phosphate onto glucose, what we discover is that that reaction becomes much more favorable. Okay? So ATP, the energy that's stored in ATP, is used by cells where it's necessary to drive reactions. Now I want to say just a little bit about that to kind of get, or hopefully give you the right impression about how this works. Okay? One of the ways that we frequently envision ATP working um, is as follows. Okay? Well, here's a reaction. I need to make this reaction go. So I'm going to go light some ATP on fire, just like I would light a candle on fire, and the energy coming off of this ATP magically makes a reaction happen. And that's decidedly what does not happen. Okay? It decidedly does not happen. Energy release from ATP, if all we do is release energy from ATP, all we will get is heat. Okay? We will get nothing happening. There's nothing to capture that energy. So when we look at how the energy from ATP is used to make a process occur, we see that the hydrolysis of ATP is coupled to the desired reaction, meaning that the enzyme that's catalyzing this reaction is binding both to the molecule that the reaction is being catalyzed on and to ATP at the same time. Both of these are binding. The hydrolysis of ATP then can cause a change in the enzyme it might cause something to be transferred, as in the example I, I gave you with the phosphate moving on to glucose. In this case, ATP is transferring a phosphate onto glucose. Right? But whatever the mechanism is, the important thing is that the hydrolysis of ATP is coupled to the undesirable reaction. It's coupled. They're both occurring in the same place at the same time. And when I say hydrolysis of ATP, I'm talking about breaking that phosphodiester bond between the third phosphate and the second phosphate. That hydrolysis yields ADP. So when we say ATP goes to ADP, we've just described a hydrolysis reaction. Okay, now that's very important to uh, understand, all right? Using energy from ATP, we can make unfavorable reactions become favorable. And that's a very, very powerful thing for cells, as we will see as we get into metabolic pathways, because we will see that metabolic pathways are grouped into two categories. One category involves what we call catabolism. Catabolism is the breakdown of bigger things into smaller things. Catabolism usually involves energy release. It usually involves oxidation and usually doesn't need assistance of ATP. We'll see minor exceptions to that, but that's basically what catabolism is involved in. Anabolism, on the other hand, is a process where smaller molecules are made into bigger ones. It usually involves reduction, and it usually requires input of energy of some sort, ATP being a very common one. Okay, and we'll talk um, about that as we get going along. So what I want to focus on now is the Gibbs free energy that your TAs have been talking to you about in recitations. And in some cases, I'm probably going to be repeating things that you already know, but I want to make sure that everybody's on the same page with what I have to say here, okay? 
Well, I trust everybody has learned from freshman chemistry, or if not from freshman chemistry, from the recitations, that delta G is um, the ultimate determinant of the direction of a reaction. Yes, ma'am? Yeah. Anabolism is the taking of small molecules and building bigger molecules. Okay? It involves reduction, and it usually requires input of energy. Yep. Other questions on that? Does yeah. It need, does it usually need ATP also? ATP it can be one of those sources of energy. It doesn't have to be, but it, but it can be one of those sources of energy. Okay. Now, the change in the Gibbs free energy for a reaction is the ultimate determinant of the direction of a reaction. We can say there's nothing else that's going to get around that. Nothing, zero, will get around the delta G. If the delta G for a reaction is negative, the reaction will go forwards as written. If the delta G for a reaction is positive, the reaction will go backwards as it's written. And those are rules that we're not going to, we're not going to be able to change. If the delta G for a reaction is zero, the system is at equilibrium. And as I've mentioned in class before, you've got to get out of your head that equilibrium means equal concentrations. It doesn't. It means that the concentration of products and reactants over time does not change. The forward reaction is going at the same rate as the backwards reaction when we're at equilibrium. No change in concentration of products and reactants. Now, those Three principles right there are things that we will use to understand metabolism. Because one of the things that a cell can do to make a reaction go forwards or make a reaction go backwards is catalyze reactions that increase or change the concentrations of products and reactants. Cells can do that by controlling their enzymes. So they can actually manipulate concentrations of products and reactants for a given reaction by controlling enzymes being on or off. That's a very powerful thing. And when a cell needs to make glucose, for example, okay, being able to manipulate those concentrations makes the synthesis of glucose a favorable process where it otherwise might not be. Very, very powerful thing for a cell to be able to do. Well, delta G, um, we recall, um, is defined by this reaction, and I've simplified the equation. Delta G is equal to the standard Gibbs free energy, also known as delta G zero prime, plus RT times the natural log concentration of products divided by the concentration of reactants. Okay? Now, this equation has parallels, as I've mentioned before, to the Henderson Hasselbach equation. Delta G zero prime is a constant, just like pKa was a constant. It's a constant for a given reaction. So if I'm talking about glucose going to glucose 6-phosphate, the delta G zero prime for that reaction will always be the same at the conditions that we use. Always the same. We're going to assume we're using the same conditions all the time. Okay. RT, R is the gas constant. T is the temperature. For our purposes, we're going to assume constant temperature. Keep things simple. We're a warm-blooded organism. Our temperature is pretty much constant. Times the natural log of the concentration of products over reactants. Concentration of products and reactants are variables there. And we can see how the ratio of products to reactants can change. Remember from the henderson hasselbach equation, the log term. If we had more salt than acid, we had a ratio greater than 1, meant the log term was positive. Same is true of natural logs. If concentration of products greater than concentration of reactants, that term is greater than 1, means the log term is positive. If, on the other hand, the concentration of reactants is greater than the concentration of products, then that ratio is less than 1, and the log term is negative. And so we see this positive and negative nature of this log term will have a pretty good effect on the overall delta G. But remember that the overall delta G is the sum of two things. It's the sum of a constant term, the delta G zero prime, and a variable term, the RT times natural log products over reactants. Connie? Um, what happens if you have more than one product? More than one what happens if you have more than one product and more than one reactant? 
We actually have to take that into consideration. I'm going to keep it simple here. So we're not going to take it, we're, we're basically going to work with simple considerations of this. But if we had more than one product or reactant, we would have to take the concentration of each one into consideration in this equation. Okay? okay? Yes, sir. On the exam, will you provide us with numeric values for R and T, or will it just show the difference in R and T in the appropriate places? It's a good question. Will I give you on the exam question, values for R and T, or let you just use that as a constant? If I remember, I will give you values. But the important thing is that they just recognize that they're constant. So if I forget for some reason, just, just use them as, assume they're just a plain constant. OK? Yes, ma'am. I should probably remember this, but um, G0, or G, yeah, G0 prime, is that room temperature? Uh, G0 prime is defined for a specific set of conditions, yes. OK? And it's not room, it's 25 some, 25 degrees, uh, whatever that turns out not, to be it's Kelvin. it's not zero C. It's not zero, no, yeah. okay? But again, we're going to assume that we've got everything at that one set of conditions, just to keep it simple, but yes. Delta G zero prime is a constant, but it's constant for a given set of conditions. That's important to recognize. Yes? So kind of when you're solving any Gibbs equations yep. on the test, is that going to be very much like solving RPH, PK equations where... Well, it, okay, so her question is, is, okay is, is the solving of Gibbs free energy equations going to be like henderson hasselbach equations? I would be amazed if it weren't, okay? Because again, what I want you to get is the big picture. I'm not having you chase numbers. I'm not expecting you're going to memorize logarithms or any of that. But you should know how that log term is going to change and how that's going to affect the value of delta G. Yeah, absolutely. Just a quick question. Is temperature in Kelvin? Temperature's in Kelvin, yeah. I'm not going to trip you up and say, here it is in centigrade and snicker, snicker, snicker. You didn't put it in Kelvin, and now you're wrong, and now you're stupid, okay? All right? <laughs> The important thing is getting the big picture, right? Not tricking students. Really don't want to trick anybody. So I could lie, then I'd really trick you. <laughs> I'm not gonna. Yeah. Yes, sir. Is there only one calculation question for second midterm? It, his question is: Is there only one calculation question for the second midterm? The answer is: I'm not going to say anything about it. I'm not going to tell you what the second midterm is. The <laughs> format will be exactly the same as the first midterm. Okay. So you saw there was a section that related to calculations, and that section had a certain number of points. I can't tell you how many calculations will be there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, so you should know how that, that that equation alters as the concentration of products and reactants, or as I put on the thing there, B over A, actually changes. All right. I think again, you learned that hopefully with henderson hasselbach It's fairly straightforward to understand. One of the places where students trip up is they forget that delta G zero prime is a constant and delta G is not a constant, okay? So remember that. Delta G is a variable and it varies as the concentration of products and reactants change. But the constant in the equation is the delta G zero prime for the given set of conditions that we're going to be using. Okay. Now, uh, look through the problems that I've put online for you. The TAs have given you some problems, or work through some of those problems. There's also problems in the book. And if you're confused or you have issues or questions, as always, p please feel free to come and see me. Uh, believe it or not, my schedule, which has been pretty impossible to catch me, is actually lightening up next week. So I should have more time available uh, to meet with anybody if you have questions. And if any time you have questions and I'm not available, um, uh, at the times it's con convenient for you, you're always welcome to send me an email and I will schedule a time to meet with you. Okay? So I want you to have opportunity to connect as, as necessary. All right. Um, let's uh, take a little diversion here thinking about energy in another way. Okay? Molecules we can sort of think of as having a sort of inherent energy associated with them. We've, sort of intuitively think of this. We think of, again, gasoline, right? Gasoline has a fair amount of energy in it. When we oxidize that gasoline, uh, we generate heat. In an automobile, of course, that heat is used to uh, move cylinders and to uh, ultimately uh, give motion to the vehicle. In our muscles, ATP has a lot of energy, and the energy of ATP is actually used to um, favor muscular contraction. And it's because of that type of gasoline, in this case ATP, that we're able to move. Uh, we will see as we move through biochemistry that there are molecules that have um, various energies. This is not a great example, but it's an example of a molecule that has a phosphate on it. And as I've sort of alluded to in class, um, molecules that have phosphates on them tend to have more 
more energy in them than the same molecule without the phosphate. So if I take off the phosphate here, I'm left with glycerol. And glycerol 3-phosphate has more energy than glycerol by itself does. Okay? Well, if I want to make a more energetic molecule, I have to use, I have to take that into consideration starting with um, a glycerol. So one of the ways I can do that in making a glycerol 3-phosphate is by coupling the addition of a phosphate to glycerol by the hydrolysis of ATP, kind of like I described earlier. And that energy of hydrolysis of ATP will favor the putting of the phosphate onto that glycerol and making of glycerol 3-phosphate. You might wonder how the energy uh, arises from um, ATP. And uh, while I'm not totally fond of this figure, uh, we notice that we think about ATP, we think of the fact that we've got this um, adenosine molecule, and on its 5' prime end, we have three phosphates, one attached to the other attached to the other. So we've got phosphate, phosphate, phosphate. And these three phosphates are all negatively charged. They really don't like each other. All right? So we can imagine that given the choice, if they had the opportunity, they will, in fact, repel each other and get away. And it's that repulsive nature of the negative charges within those phosphates that ultimately give rise to the energy of ATP. ATP doesn't go flying apart because the electrons that are found in the phosphates can be rearranged in a resonant fashion as you see on the screen. Okay? So they can sort of swap the electrons back and forth and because of that the triphosphate bond is not going to fall apart automatically but when it is hydrolyzed that repulsive nature of the phosphates is going to yield energy. This is a uh, table. I'm not going to expect you to memorize this or anything, but I just show you this to show you the various energies associated with some high energy molecules inside of cells. And the energies associated here may surprise you a little bit. There's the energy of ATP. That is the hydrolysis of ATP to ADP gives this much energy in terms of kilojoules per mole or this much energy in terms of kilocalories per mole. They're just a difference of units or all they are. Okay? That negative number tells you that, first of all, it's a favorable reaction. This is the delta G0 prime, the standard free energy. I may have said delta G, but I meant delta G0 prime of the hydrolysis of these. And what we see is that there are molecules in the cell that have a higher energy of hydrolysis than ATP. Now, if ATP is the gasoline that powers the cell, how in the world does a molecule like ATP, which doesn't have that much energy in it, favor the synthesis of molecules that have even more energy inside of them? Well, you might look at this and say, well, maybe they use two ATPs or three ATPs. And the answer is cells don't have that option. So cells have to make molecules that have high energy, higher energy than ATP does, and to do that, they have to be able to take other things into consideration. The number one thing they will take into consideration, as we will see, is the um, um, delta G equation itself. Okay? So look at this reaction. This is an interesting reaction. All right? Here, this reaction is showing us how the body synthesizes one of those high energy molecules. If you go back and you look at that table I just showed you, there's uh, creatine phosphate right there. It's got more energy in it than ATP itself does. How do we put that in there? Well, here's the reaction that the cell goes through. All right? We can see ATP is, in fact, an energy source for this reaction. And we can see that the overall delta G0 prime for this reaction is positive. Now, what that means is if I start with equal concentrations, of products and reactants, okay, let's plug the numbers in here. If I have an equal concentration of B, which is creatine phosphate, and I have an equal, con let's say creatine phosphate and ADP, and I have an equal concentration of creatine and ATP, this value is 1, the log term is 0, right? That means that the delta G will equal the delta G0 prime, which is a positive number, which means the reaction goes which direction? Backwards. How do I make that reaction go forwards? 
How do I make the overall delta G be negative? The only thing I can change is change the concentrations of the products and reactants. So if I dump in a bunch of reactant, then I make the reaction go forwards. Because that's going to make this log term up here be more negative. And I make it negative enough, the overall delta G is going to, move for, is going to be negative. Right? Now, this turns out to have great physiological relevance. The great physiological relevance is this, OK? Let's imagine, so creatine phosphate is used in our muscles, OK? I'm going to bitch about creatine in a minute. But creatine phosphate is used in our muscles. And it's used kind of like myoglobin is used for oxygen. Remember I said myoglobin was a great way of storing oxygen? And when the oxygen concentrations got low, what happened? Well, that's when myoglobin gave up its oxygen, but only when it got very low. Turns out creatine phosphate is used to make ATP when cells run out of ATP. Now, let's think about this. I am uh, going out and I am going to run a 100-yard dash. I get to the, the, the starting line, OK? And the gun goes off. And I take off, and I start running as fast as I can. What's going to happen? Well, muscular contraction requires ATP. I start out, my ATP concentration is fairly high. So this reaction has been driven fairly, fairly far to the right. But I've got enough ATP to get started. I go a few yards, and before metabolism starts kicking in and uh, epinephrine starts flowing and all that adrenaline starts running, before all that can happen, my ATP levels inside of my muscles fall very quickly because I'm burning it as fast as I can run, which for me isn't very fast, but I can still burn it fairly fast. All right? What happens when my ATP concentrations go down? What happens to the delta G of this reaction? It starts going more positive, and it starts going more positive, the reaction starts going back to the left. And when it goes back to the left, look what we make, ATP. We don't have to do anything. Our cells don't have to have any control. They don't have to have any brains. All they have to have is this equation right here, such that when I take off and I start unbalancing this equation by running, this equation rebalances itself by making ATP, because it uses this stuff right here and this stuff right here to drive it backwards. That's really cool. Then when I finish my race and I grab that piece of pizza and a uh, mug of beer to celebrate the fact that I just won that race, I'm not burning ATP anymore. And I'm putting all kinds of energy in my body that's going to make ATP. ATP concentrations start going high. What's going to happen? Well, the products are going to get Larger, I mean, sorry, the, the reactants are going to get larger in concentration, and this reaction is going to move to the right. And I will go back and I will store creatine phosphate. Thus, <laughs> cells can make a high energy molecule that's higher than the energy of ATP simply by concentration. It tells us that concentration is absolutely critical for making molecules. Absolutely critical. And it's magical enough that we can actually make higher energy molecules simply by altering concentrations of products and reactants. That's a really phenomenal thing. Now, I promised I was going to bitch about creatine, so I will. Okay? One of the most common questions I get is, so creatine, I hear about that. I can really improve my athletic performance by taking creatine and all this. And all my friends are taking this stuff, and it's really great. And they say it really makes them feel really like they've got a lot of energy. I say, OK, well, let's think about this. I'm going to go run this race so in about an hour, so I'm going to go take a whole bunch of creatine. Wow, man, I'm going to be so winning this race, right? Well, let's look at this equation. When I start making a, taking a whole bunch of creatine in my system, which way is this reaction going to go? <laughs> right. right. And if I've got a whole bunch of creatine sitting there, is it going to go back? No. Duh, uh. <laughs> right? Then I get the second question. Well, what if you took a whole bunch of creatine phosphate? <laughs> well, if you took a whole bunch of creatine phosphate, 
wouldn't you ultimately be increasing your concentration of creatine over here as well? So in the longer term, you're going to have more of a problem? Yes. Okay. Should you be playing with Mother Nature here? No. Okay. Might you feel differently? Probably. The brain's a very easily malleable thing. Okay. If you think that something is going to happen, you may very well feel that happen. Does it alter athletic performance? It probably does to some extent. Is it good for you? I would probably say no. Okay. So, but you can certainly see in the context of this reaction that taking creatine just before a race might not be the smartest thing for you to do. It just might not be the smartest thing for you to do. Okay, questions about that? I'm rambling and griping and all that sort of stuff. Connie? Okay, so you have decreased amounts of creatine and ATP despite the fact that it's um, endotonic, it will go and that direction. Yes. Is that something that you can if I, if I make enough of this stuff, it's going to favor it going to the right. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So, but you also said earlier that um, that creatine phosphate has more energy than ATP, and you can't go up, oh, maybe you'll use two ATP. So where does that extra energy come from? Where does the extra energy come from? It comes simply from the concentration. Oh. So that's what, this, that's what this reaction, that's what this equation is actually telling us, that we gain energy as a result of concentration. There's energy from concentration. Oh. Yeah. Yes, sir. See, this is the guy that's been talking to these people. <laughs> what happens if you do it way before? You're going to figure out the right time to take this stuff, and it's going to go. Okay. You, you probably do, as I say, you probably do have enough leg effect. I'm not trying to pick on you here. It probably does have an effect on performance. But it's hard to predict where you're going to get that, that sweet spot and where you're not going to get that. And that's why I'm saying it's probably not a good idea to mess with. But, but you're right. There, there are considerations with that. And there are some studies that suggest that you may increase it somewhat. The thing that I say to those is... You know, there's all kinds of things that you can do for athletic performance, but increasing athletic performance does not mean increased health. Okay? If you look at the lifespan of professional athletes, it's lower on average than that of non-professional athletes. Okay? So students frequently have the notion that the, the maximizing athletic performance is the best thing that you can do for yourself, and it's not. It's only good for running footballs, and it's only good for running races, and it's good for hitting baseballs, but it may not be good for health, okay? And so that's important to keep in mind, okay? That's why I gripe about it. Okay, other comments or questions? Everybody's going to go see they can find some creatine phosphate now, I can see. Yeah? On that list you showed us of higher energy molecules, one of them was a one Bisphosphoglycerate? Yep. Is that related to the 2,3-BBG we looked at earlier? Good eye. So his question was, I showed this table that had 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate in it. Is it related to 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate that I've talked about before? And where did I show it there? It's right uh, there. Okay. Um, it turns out that it is indirectly related to it, yes. Uh, but, and, and we'll see when we uh, watch how this guy is metabolized. Uh, actually, not this guy, but the product of this guy is metabolized we'll see how 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate comes about. It doesn't come directly from this, no, but it is related. Is there any known enzyme that transfers one of those phosphates from a 1 to a 2 position or vice versa so it could be used as an energy source? Yeah. So his question is, are there enzymes that convert 1 to 2 to make a 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate 2, 3, 2, 3 from 1,3 bisphosphoglycerate? Um, there are some people who say that's the way that it, it actually forms. Um, and so there are enzymes that may be involved in that, but I will show you a much more important consideration when we look at glycolysis itself. So because of this consideration in glycolysis, you'll see that you don't have to worry about this enzyme converting one into two. Okay? Oh, there we go. Yeah. I've gotten pretty good at recognizing the damn thing. Okay. All right. Other questions? How are we doing on time? Okay. All right. Uh, let's see, there's our reaction I've just finished there. Now, what I've been telling you all along are the considerations that we have for our body. This, in summary, is what our body is always concerned about. The cells of our body are always concerned about this. Our body has to do certain things. And these things that it has to do require input of energy. They include moving in the form of muscular contraction, they include active transport, as we'll talk about next term, where they're moving things across the membrane. 
biosynthesis. If we want to make glucose from simple starting materials, we've got to put energy in to do that. And signal amplification. We're transmitting information down a nerve cell. We have to be able to have energy to do that. Ultimately, the energy for all of these processes is coming from ATP going to ADP or something equivalent. Well, how do we get ATP? We get ATP from the processes on the bottom. And these largely involve oxidation or photosynthesis. Since we don't have the option of photosynthesis, we're stuck with oxidation, which means that we're eating things that plants have made, ultimately. Okay? So oxidation makes ATP. These processes use ATP. We have to balance these if we hope to be um, effective. When I say oxidation, it's important to understand what that means. Okay? Oxidation means the loss of electrons. The process of losing electrons is the process of oxidation. Now, as you'll hear me say many times, electrons don't just disappear. Okay? In chemical reactions, we can't create or destroy matter. So when I say loss of electrons, I'm not talking about them evaporating. Those electrons have to go somewhere. And we'll see cells have some very, very cool uh, ways of handling those electrons. The handling of those electrons turns out to be very critical for making ATP. Some very cool ways that cells do it. But for the moment, we're just going to be concerned ourselves with the loss of those electrons. If I go from methane to methanol, I've gone through an oxidation. And by the way, oxidation doesn't equate with oxygen. In this case, we see an oxygen getting put on. But we don't see another oxygen getting put on here. Yet it's an oxidation. Oxidation simply means, as I said, the loss of electrons. And going from here to here, this carbon has lost electrons. Okay? Losing electrons. As I go from here to here, I've lost electrons. I go from here to here, I lose electrons. I go from here to here, I lose electrons. And at this point, I have carbon at its highest oxidative state. Meaning, I can't oxidize this guy any further. The delta G0 primes for each of these reactions okay, goes from all right, minus 820, telling me there's a lot of energy in here. Minus 703, there's a lot of energy in here. Minus 523, there's a lot of energy in here. Each time we go down, we see there's less energy because what's happened? Some of that energy was given up in making this. Some of that energy was given up in making this. Some was given up in making this. And finally, some was given up in making this. Carbon dioxide is the ultimate oxidation product of metabolic processes. The ultimate oxidation product of metabolic processes. That's why we exhale carbon dioxide. It's of no more use to us, folks. It does us no more good. We can't get any more energy out of it, so let's get it out of our system and get something else that's going to get us some more energy. And alcohol is at a higher, or a, a, a more reduced state. As we go from right to left, we're more reduced. As we go from left to right, we're more oxidized. Okay? Methanol is more reduced than formaldehyde, but it is more oxidized than methane. OK. What you see on the screen are two of the most important uh, energy sources for cells, glucose and fatty acids. Fatty acids, of course, are stored in fats. These guys have very, very different ways of being handled in our body. They both get oxidized. They both get oxidized. In fact, fatty acids have more energy in them per carbon than glucose does. If we calculate energy per carbon, there's more energy in fatty acids than there is in glucose. And you could look at this and think, well, that sort of makes sense. Most of the carbons here are carbon hydrogens. Most of the carbons here are carbon hydroxides. This is starting out at a higher oxidized state than this one is. But I said they're handled in the body very differently than 
That is, the two are handled very differently from each other. Why is that? Well, it turns out glucose is water soluble. Our body can dump glucose into our bloodstream and do nothing more with it. It dissolves, it flows in the blood nicely, and everybody's happy. And since the blood is flowing through our body rapidly, it gets to its targets very quickly. And we need to escape from that grizzly bear that's chasing us. Our muscles have that glucose in seconds. Fatty acids, on the other hand, aren't very water soluble. They're usually tied up with glycerol to make fat. Fat is completely water insoluble. But fat also, if it, wants, if it wants to give us the energy that we need, it has to travel through our bloodstream. But moving something through our bloodstream that is not water soluble is a real problem. Fat has to be packaged up into bundles. You've heard of LDLs and HDLs? These are the bundles that fat and fatty acids are carried in in our body. It takes a while to make those. Fatty acids are not very good sources of quick energy. Glucose is a wonderful source of quick energy. So our body burns glucose very readily. OK. Uh, blah, blah. I'll talk about that later. There's the 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. Okay. This is a really interesting example about how cells are combining a couple of things in one process. I'll talk about it when I talk about glycolysis on Monday, but suffice it to say that this reaction is the, a very important reaction in our cells because it involves oxidation. We see this going from an aldehyde to an ester. That oxidation transfers electrons to an electron carrier known as NAD to make NADH. And yes, electron carriers are the magic that cells have for dealing with those electrons. And the energy of this oxidation is used to put a phosphate all by itself onto this molecule over here. Now, that, those three things really turn out to be very cool when we talk about how glycolysis works. Because we've made this molecule right here that has high energy, this guy now, you saw in that table I showed you before, had more energy in it than ATP did. It becomes really easy for this guy to transfer its phosphate onto ADP and make ATP. This is one of the ways in which we make ATP in the cell. Not a common way, but it's one of the ways in which we do it. Okay. More importantly in our cells, and we'll talk about this next term, the way that we make ATP is by the use of mitochondria and gradients of protons. It's a phenomenon known as electron transport and oxidative phosphorylation. The best example I can, or the best analogy I can give you for this is that of charging a battery. We'll see that cells use the process of oxidation to charge, literally charge a battery. Oxidative phosphorylation. Okay. So we charge the battery, and then the charge of that battery is used to make ATP. Electron transport is the process whereby we charge the battery. Oxidative phosphorylation is the process where we use the charge of that battery to make ATP. And that's how the vast majority of ATP in our bodies is actually made. OK, I talked about catabolism briefly earlier in the lecture. And suffice it to say that catabolism involves breaking down large molecules into smaller molecules. Here's some metabolic pathways in the process. The upshot of all of this is we get ATP out. In general, catabolic processes, as I said, take large molecules, break them into small molecules, involves oxidation, and it releases energy that's captured in the form of ATP. Anabolism is the opposite of this. We take small molecules, we build them into larger molecules. It requires reduction and it requires input of energy. OK. Now, let's spend a minute talking about electron carriers. Cells are set up in a very interesting way so that the oxidations that occur in cells are fairly small in nature, relatively small. What does that mean? 
Okay? It means that the energy released in any given oxidation in a cell doesn't give up too much energy. Another consideration is if oxidation involves loss of electrons, handling those electrons is critical because if the electrons are simply lost, they go on to molecules and make very reactive molecules that may cause problems reacting with things that we don't want. Cells are control freaks. They don't want to have rea molecules reacting on their own, so rather than letting those electrons go on to whatever the first thing happens to be that gloms on to them, cells transfer electrons to specific carriers that hold on to those electrons and keep them from creating other reactive molecules. That's a very important consideration. The electron carriers that cells use, there are three main ones that we will uh, talk about. Right? One of these I just showed you, it's known as NAD. No, you don't have to know the structure. NAD is the oxidized form, meaning it is lacking a couple of electrons. If I transfer two electrons to NAD, I usually transfer one proton as well, and that gives me NADH. When you see NADH, you're seeing the reduced form. It's already gotten a proton and two electrons. There's a related molecule known as NADP. NADP is the oxidized form, and when it gets two electrons in a proton, it becomes NADPH. NADPH being the reduced form, NADP being the oxidized form. The third category of molecules involved in carrying electrons are the flavins, FAD, flavin adenine dinucleotide. FAD is the oxidized form, lacking the, those two electrons. If I put two electrons onto FAD, I usually put two protons as well, and I make FADH2. So FADH2 is the reduced form, and FAD is the oxidized form. Now, we'll see next term what happens to those molecules once they've gotten the electrons in them. Okay? There's actually energy being stored in these molecules by holding on to those electrons. One of the ways in which those molecules can use those electrons is to reduce something else. Look at this reaction here. Here is an alcohol. An alcohol is being oxidized to a, to a uh, ketone. That involves loss of electrons. Where are those electrons going? Well, they're being put on to NAD plus and making NADH. This is the most oxidized form. The alcohol is the, I'm sorry, the most reduced form of the, of the carbon is here. The most oxidized form is here. The most oxidized form of the carrier is here, and the most reduced form of the carrier is here. I always like to say that for every oxidation, there's an equal and opposite reduction. It's true. This guy's getting oxidized, this guy's getting reduced. What if I go backwards? I could, can I use those electrons of NADH to make this? I certainly can. So one of the things I can do is use this as a repository for holding on to electrons. OK, that's a good place to have a song, I think, and call it a week. What do you guys say? What's that? The good part. All right. So this is a very short song. It's about Delta G. It's to the tune of Danny Boy. Oh, De Delta G, the change in gives free energy. Can tell us if a process will advance. Because if the value's less than naught, it translates that. Reverse reactions haven't got a chance. But when the sign is plus, it is the opposite. And then the backwards happens all the time. A factor is the standard gives free energy. So don't forget about the delta G naught prime. Okay, see you guys on Monday. Say it again? Often after you have the reaction, you have NADH plus H plus. The H plus there, yeah. Why don't you just have two NADH?